Thank you all for coming today. We really appreciate it. Um, this is our last lecture in our spring series. Um, we do continue to have lectures and, and workshops throughout the summer. Usually the summer is workshops, um, so this will be our last real lecture. Uh, my name is Ramya. For those of you that don't know, I am the Citizen Science Coordinator for the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. We have lectures, as you, as you may know, throughout the year, usually every third Thursday of the month. Um, if you're interested in being on our mailing list so you can find out about future lectures and workshops, I have a uh, sign-up sheet in the back. I'll make sure that you get on our mailing list. Today we have presenting for us Dr. Larry Brand from uh, Rasmus. He is uh, an expert in algal blooms. That's what he's going to talk to us about today um, and several other things. Today we're specifically going to talk about uh, red tide and uh, blue-green algae and the human impacts that, that those can have. So without further ado, I will hand it off to you, Dr. Brand. Thank you. Okay, these are the names that uh, most people know them as, but uh, we decided to just call these blue green algae, we call them cyanobacteria, so I might sometimes refer to them, we didn't call them that. And the red tide is one we have one on the west coast, and it's a particular type of algae called the dinoflagellate. Okay, so basically what I'll be talking about is how you start out with with excess, how excess nutrients can lead to excess algal blooms, and some of these <coughs> species of algae produce toxins, which then have an effect on humans. Today, we're trying to feed seven and a half billion people on this planet. It takes a lot of food, that takes a lot of nutrients. The actual difference if it's higher plants on land or algae in the ocean, they need two major nutrients. The two major nutrients they need are nitrogen and phosphorus, and they need them in about a 16 to 1 ratio, and that'll become important in a second. Well, when you fertilize the crops, uh, it's not high percent efficient, so a certain amount of these uh, fertilizers run off downstream into your waterways, and that can generate algal blooms. Okay. So the extent that the fertilizer ends up in the plants, we eat them, uh, expel the material, and again, the nutrients don't disappear, they have to go someplace, and they end up in the sewage. And again, if that sewage then leaks into your local waterway downstream, then that can also generate algal blooms. So, not surprising, and this is not just a local issue here in South Florida, this is throughout the world, as we've got more and more fertilizer to feed 7 and a half billion people, there's more and more harmful algal blooms throughout the world. It's a global issue. Okay. And not surprising, most of these harmful algal blooms are downstream of either your agricultural areas or your large urban areas. Generally, you'll see nitrogen phosphorus in roughly the 61 ratio because that's what you need. Fertilizer and that's what you end up with. 99.9% of the ocean, you'll see it in roughly that 16 to 1 ratio. But I'll show you three things here in South Florida that alter that ratio, and that becomes critically important. Okay. So if for some reason you start out with a nitrogen phosphorus ratio at 32 to 1, now the plants take it up in a 16 to 1 ratio, you're going to run out of phosphorus first, and you have excess nitrogen just hanging out there. So we call that a phosphorus in an ecosystem. If you add more nitrogen, you, can't, you don't get a larger algal bloom because they're phosphorus limited, not nitrogen. If you add more phosphorus to this ecosystem, now you get a larger algal bloom. On the other hand, if you start out with the reverse, start out with an 8 to 1 ratio of 16 to 2, now when the plants take it up in a 16 to 1 ratio, you're going to run out of nitrogen first, and you have excess phosphorus in that. So you have a nitrogen limited ecosystem. Okay. If you understand that concept, you understand more than most of our politicians and policymakers. Okay. So we'll see. Okay, uh, I actually first got involved in harmful algal blooms back in the 90s. Uh, back in the 80s, a large bloom of blue green algae developed in the north central part of Florida Bay. Here's the mainland of Florida, here's the Florida Keys here, it's triangular area, here's Florida Bay. That's very peculiar because, well, let me back up. My color scheme here is to be blue is low abundance of algae, red is high abundance of algae. I've adjusted the scale such, what you'll notice here, Biscayne Bay here is really low in algae. Now, it's got somewhat elevated levels, it's not completely pristine, but by the scale I'm using here, this is low abundance of algae compared to this massive bloom you've got down here in Florida Bay. And that's very peculiar because you've got two and a half million people living right next to Biscayne Bay in relatively low abundance of algae. And down here, this is Everglades National Park. This is all in here, out in the middle of nowhere, you've got this huge bloom. So that was a puzzle. How did you suddenly develop this bloom in the 1980s out in the middle of nowhere? Nowhere near an urban area, nowhere near 
agricultural areas. Okay, well, once I figured out what was going on with Florida Bay, I got interested in Mountain Blues throughout South Florida. And so since then, I've expanded my sampling program on like Biscayne Bay and Florida Bay, but uh, the whole West Coast where we get the red tide, Lake Okeechobee, the Clusetia River, San Lucy, Estuary, Canal, and so on, and in, in inland areas here in Everglades Natural. Okay, so I'm going to first focus on Florida Bay here. It's just a close up of this, of this bloom. And the first thing you notice, peculiar, is you see high phosphorus in the western part of Florida Bay and high nitrogen in the eastern part of the bay. So that can't be the result of fertilizer or sewage because you have both nitrogen and phosphorus in the same place. That tells you there's two different sources. And what I've done here is I'm looking at the ratio of nitrogen and phosphorus. Over here, these blue dots indicate a very high nitrogen phosphorus ratio. Excess nitrogen, so phosphorus is the limiting feature. And over here, the red dots indicate a low N to P ratio below that 16 to 1, so it's a nitrogen limit ecosystem. And you get that 16 to 1 ratio right here in the middle, right there where the big algorithm. That's the chemical data. Well, some complexities here, which I'll ignore. But the point is, we then do bio bioassays to confirm the chemical data, and that's what this shows. Blue dots indicate it's a phosphorus of an ecosystem over here. The red dots indicate a nitrogen ecosystem. Okay, so basic idea here is you've got high phosphorus in the west, high nitrogen in the east, and where they meet in the middle is where you get the large algal bloom. So now I'll talk for a second about what's called the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. This was uh, passed to Glenn in around two th the year 2000. And at that time it was $7.8 billion. Now it's up to $15 billion. And they don't have much to show for it. Okay. This was stimulated by two things. The primary thing was uh, starting around uh, in the 1980s, we started seeing a huge ecological change in the Everglades uh, as a result of phosphorus pollution coming out of the sugar cane farms to the north. Okay? And that led to the 1988 to the federal government suing the state of Florida for allowing pollution of the Everglades. The second thing that happened, the massive uh, blooms of algae in Florida Bay and huge uh, die off of the seagrass is a total change of the ecosystem in Florida Bay. Those are the two major issues that led to this Everglades restoration plan. And I'm going to focus just on the Florida Bay part of this. Okay? The idea here is that uh, there is a reduced freshwater flow down in the Florida Bay. And that's certainly true because all the water used to flow south, and now a lot of that water, in order to keep the western suburbs of Miami and Fort Lauderdale dry and maintain the sugar cane farms and other agricultural areas dry and so on, a lot of that water is diverted to the east and west down the St. Lucie Canal and the Cruciatchee River. Right? And the idea here, then the hypothesis, is Bay gets too salty. There's not enough fresh water coming in, the bay deep gets too salty and gets too salty for the seagrasses and they die off. Seagrasses die off, they decompose, release nutrients, and then those nutrients feed the algal blooms. Okay? Makes sense until you start looking at the data. Then you start running into some problems. Okay, first of all, these blue lines are to show the salinity of the bay during the drought. Now, normal salinity, saltiness of the seawater, is around 37 parts per thousand. Here's normal seawater over here. It's only a slightly elevated here. It's up to 50 up in here. Okay, But we know from study, from various studies, the seagrasses can tolerate 50 parts per thousand. Okay? But notice these red and brown areas are the areas of the major seagrass top. Most of your seagrass top is over here in normal spring seawater. It had nothing to do with high salinity. Same thing over here. Most of the normal seawater. And furthermore, if you look at the history of flow in the Florida Bay, yes, back in the 60s and 70s, there's very little fresh water going into the bay. But because of policy changes in the 80s, which I'll come back to later on, there was actually an increase in the uh, uh, fresh water flow, and therefore a decrease in salinity during the 80s, precisely when the seagrasses died and the algal blooms were gone. It's actually the opposite of the hypothesis. Major seagrass dolphins in 1987, after a number of years of increased freshwater flow in the bay, not decreased. There was a drought here, and then even more freshwater flow. Okay. Furthermore, if you just go look at all the historical records, 
But you'll find back in the 50s and 60s, Florida Bay was up to 65, 70 parts per thousand, and no seagrass top. Maine, crystal clear water, lush seagrass meadows, etc. It's only in the 80s, now all of a sudden you see the salinity go down. So actually, your seagrass dog here in 87 was after decreased salinity. So the exact opposite of this $15 billion hypothesis. Okay. It's actually increased freshwater flow, reduced salinity. That's when you see the seagrass dog. Same thing spatially. Seagrass dog was in the low saline, not the high saline. Okay. And of course, the nutrients can't be explained by seagrass dog because if the uh, seagrass dock was a major source of nutrients, then the nitrogen and phosphorus should be in the same place. But you see them in two different places. Furthermore, around this time of uh, water in Florida Bay, it was only worth a year. Here it is 30 years later, those nutrients are still there in the same place, in the same pattern. Okay. So there's got to be another source for those nutrients. Oops. And notice also the argument here is that you have seagrass dial first and then alcohol. That's contradicted by the data too. Now we don't actually have scientific data back in the 80s, but the fishermen are out there every day. So Karen D. Maria interviewed a bunch of fishermen, and what they said is they start seeing the water in 1981, starting to get cloudy, have a hard time seeing the bottom. Water got dirtier, the balloons grew, and the seagrasses started dying. Okay, water first started becoming dirty, then algae blooms started, and then seagrass died. The algal blooms came first, seagrass died off came later. Again, the opposite of this 15 billion dollar hypothesis. Macroalgae laid so thick on the bottom that it denuded everything. It just killed off everything. Okay, so virtually every aspect of this $15 billion hypothesis is wrong in most examples. Again, the basic idea is phosphorus is in the West. Okay, why is that phosphorus there? It shouldn't be there. Okay. The reason is that South Florida Peninsula is basically just a big limestone mountain out in the middle of the ocean. Okay? And we know from numerous studies, it's well, well established, that calcium covered in limestone chemically scavenges phosphorus from the water. Numerous studies have shown this. Okay? So if you start out with nitrogen phosphorus in that 16 to 1 ratio, that limestone is going to suck the phosphorus out. And you're going to have a phosphorus limited system. So that was actually the toughest thing to figure out. And I came to the conclusion after a long time was. Turns out, many millions of years ago, with the Miocene, there was an unusual oceanographic event to the north of Florida. And this happens every so often in the Earth's history. You get this uh, unusual type of upwelling system that generates large phosphorite deposits. Okay. Subsequent to that, there's an uplift of the Appalachian Mountains, and these materials got eroded down the length of the Florida Peninsula. And today, you can find these large phosphate deposits at the surface, just there to east of Tampa Bay. Okay? And that's been developed into huge phosphate mines today. It's a huge industry. Indeed, those mines uh, produce about one-fourth of all the phosphate fertilizer in the entire world. They produce a strip mine all in Fulton County. Now, my first hypothesis, well, maybe this stuff is you know, coming down the Peace River here into the coastal waters and then carried down to western Florida Bay. But there are a number of reasons why I concluded that was not the case. I'll just give you one example. If you sample uh, all the different uh, ponds, lagoons in Everglades National Park, here's uh, Flamingo down here, here's West Lake. Anyway, what you find in the eastern side of Everglades National Park, you see low phosphorus. The western side is high. But that can't be coming from those deposits by the mines or anything along the coastal because these are isolated ponds and lagoons. They're not connected to the ocean. How is that phosphorus doing? So it turns out I started asking some of my geology colleagues at Erasmus, and it turned out there's a bunch of unpublished data showing that those phosphate deposits were to the surface up there east of Tampa Bay continue all the way along the western side of the peninsula, all the way down to the southern tip here. Okay? And they reached the coastline right there in the 10,000 Islands area and western Florida Bay. And these phosphate deposits are about 50 feet below the bay. You now look at surface water phosphorus, you see the same pattern. High over in the 10,000 Islands area and down here in western Florida Bay. So now the question is, if that's the source, how do you get that phosphorus up to the surface? Well, it turns out, not to be people are aware of this, we have something called 
geothermal circulation here for you. That limestone's pretty uh, porous. If you drill down, once you get down about 3,000 feet or so, you see that water's warmer. It's because the core of the earth is extremely hot because the radioactive decay. So you think of this as like a giant pot of boiling water, except very, very slow. What you're doing is you're heating the water down here. Hot, hot water rises, comes up to the surface, that cools up, and you entrain cold water from the sides of the peninsula, the Straits of Florida, and the Gulf of Mexico. So that's the basic idea here. Uh, you've got this geothermal circulation that's bringing that water up to the surface. It's coming through those phosphate deposits, bringing the phosphorus up to the surface. And we used a bunch of isotopes that confirmed that was happening. I'm going to go into all the details here. Okay. The bottom line then is the western part of the peninsula here. The Everglades, Biscayne Bay, and Eastern Florida Bay is dominated by limestone, so it's going to be a phosphorus limited ecosystem. Okay. Biscayne Bay is phosphorus limited. Okay. As you move over to the western side, however, now you've got those phosphorite deposits. Now you shift over to a nitrogen limit to get excess phosphorus. That's why we see that big gradient there in Florida Bay. And this goes right on up the coastline, then. Just Here's a bunch of nutrient bioassays, right on up, Sandbell Island, and further on up. That's all a nitrogen limited ecosystem because of the excess phosphorus, which altered those nitrogen phosphorus ratios. We can explain the phosphorus now, but you can't, but we didn't, I mean, that's been there for millions of years. But we only got the balloon starting in the 1980s. But you can't form an algal bloom with just phosphorus, you gotta have the nitrogen too. So we have to look at the other half of the story now. Where is that nitrogen? That's actually turned out to be a lot easier. Here's your nitrogen. If you now look at salinity in the bay, the yellow here is low salinity. That's fresh water coming out of the Everglades. Okay. So what we're going to do now is go upstream, we'll do a transect. Okay. Here's Lake Okeechobee, here's the Everglades agricultural area. That's basically 90% sugarcane. And then here's what's called the water conservation areas, and then here's Everglades National. We do a transect from sugarcane farms down to eastern Florida Bay. Okay, here's the transect here, from sugarcane farms down to Florida Bay. Okay. Here's the sugarcane farms here, and here's Florida Bay here. The red is phosphorus. Okay. So here's your phosphorus fertilizer in the sugarcane farm, and it's flowing south, and that's what the federal lawsuit was about. That phosphorus was polluting the Everglades, which was causing ecological change. Because the Everglades are a phosphorus limited ecosystem. Okay. But you'll notice that phosphorus never makes it all the way down to Florida Bay. It gets scavenged out by the plants and the limestone long before it ever makes it to Florida Bay. And that's why you saw low phosphorus in eastern Florida Bay. But now if you look at the nitrogen, okay, you see the same thing initially. But now what I've done here is I've adjusted the scales. These two uh, lines are used, I'm using different scales. This is the nitrogen. Such that if they were in that nitrogen phosphorus was in that 16 to 1 ratio that plants like, those two lines should be on top of each other. So in fact, you've got this huge excess of nitrogen. The actual nitrogen to phosphorus ratio here in the sugarcane farms is more like 100 to 1 to 200 to 1. A huge excess of nitrogen. Okay. So what happens here is initially the plants are taking up the nitrogen, but once the plants here run out of phosphorus, they don't really have much use for the nitrogen anymore. The rest of the nitrogen just flows right all the way down, all the way into Florida Bay. And that's why you sell that high nitrogen in eastern Florida Bay. Okay. Now you might initially think, well, that's that's fertilizer oil as well. But if you're thinking about that for a second, if your plants need nitrogen phosphorus in a 16 to 1 ratio, why would a farmer add fertilizer in a 100 to 200 to 1 ratio, knowing that plants are not going to use most of the nitrogen, most of it's just going to run right on off. You're wasting your time, you're wasting your money on Turns out that's not fertilizer. The reason for that is we have to think of the watershed of South Florida. We take the Florida as being very flat, but it's not completely flat. Uh, for certain geological reasons, you've got a ridge right along the coastline here called the Atlantic Coastal Ridge. You've got another ridge right down the center of the state here, the uh, Lake Wales Ridge. And so that generates our watershed. Now, rather than the water flowing east and west, it gets channelized by these two ridges, and you force the water the entire down the entire length of uh, 
South Florida. You're starting up here in the Kissimmee River Basin, flowing into Lake Okeechobee, through the Everglades, down the Florida Bay. That's our watershed. If we look at that system from the side, you got a ridge here, you got a ridge here, and a trough in the middle. Now, if you go back about 5,000 years ago, as we're coming out of the last ice age, sea levels rising, getting more and more moisture and our climate here in South Florida, you start filling that trough with water. That's how you warm a wetland. Okay. Fill it up. Plants grow in here in this wetland, and when the plants die, the organic matter sinks down, goes anaerobic, and you preserve that as an organic peat. So what's happened over the last 5,000 years is you filled up the entire trough here with this organic peat. That's how you form the Everglades over the last 5,000 years. And when you form the organic peat, you preserve the nitrogen, so that organic peat is extremely rich in nitrogen. That's why the farmers love it, because they don't have to spend any money on nitrogen fertilizer. It's extremely uh, rich and rich uh, soil. The problem is, as long as it's underwater, you preserve that organic peat. As soon as you drain that organic peat, it's like 99% organic matter. As soon as you drain it and expose it to the air, the oxygen in the air, bacteria break down the organic matter, turn it into CO2. Soil essentially just disappears. At the same time, you release that nitrogen. Okay. This leads to what we call land subsidence. Okay. Well, this is showing, here's a map showing you have up to 10 to 15 feet of organic peat in the Everglades. And now much of it's disappearing. And you get what we call subsidence. Here's a picture taken in uh, 1927. That was the surface of the soil. This is out in Everglades someplace. Okay. That was the surface of the soil. And then in 2012, when this picture was taken, that's the surface of the soil. You've lost all of that organic peat simply by draining the soil. Okay. And so basically what's happened is we've released 5,000 years worth of nitrogen in the last 50 to 100 years simply by draining the Everglades. Here's a house that was built in 1930. That was the surface of the soil in 1930. And now all the soil has disappeared below the house. So now every few years you have to add another step here to the stairs to get up to the front door. Okay. Here's a history of sugarcane farming in the uh, northern through the Everglades. You can see it just sort of hovers along here until 1959 and then shoots up. What happened in 1959? The Cuban Revolution. Okay. Middle of the Cold War. The US government's not happy having a communist dictator only 100 miles to the south. So they proceed to try to get rid of Fidel Castro. The bad pigs didn't work out too well. Exploding cigars didn't work, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So they just tried to, decided to try to destroy the Cuban economy, which at that time was sugarcane. Uh, so through a complex series of tariffs, subsidies, et cetera, they promoted uh, sugarcane growing in the Everglades. So that's what you see happening here. And this, of course, was so successful at getting rid of the Del Castro regime there <laughs> that we still subsidize the sugar industry to the tune of about, depending on how you calculate, two to five billion dollars. Sugarcane farming increased in the 60s, but we didn't get the alcohol boom until the 80s. Why is that? This would naturally be Everglades. What season would naturally flood? Okay. To keep that dry, the you know, armor core engineers actually built dikes and they installed giant pumps and they reversed the flow of water in South Florida. Okay, giant pumps and you pump the water back upstream. And there's natural flow of people from north to south. Now all of a sudden you have this flooding going back up north into Lake Ocho and then down the Pusat River to the west and South Lucy Canal to the east. Okay. Now, this is sort of like the Netherlands. You gotta constantly pump that water out to keep it dry. Okay. So I'll just show you some data. Uh, at this station here, halfway between the sugarcane farms and Florida Bay. Okay. What happened was, they initially started in the 60s and 70s, they backed most of the water, back up Lake Okeechobee and then down. And not surprisingly, over time, more and more nutrients go into Lake Okeechobee, you get huge changes in that ecosystem, massive algal blooms, fish kills, and eventually lawsuits in the 70s. So in the 1980s, they said, okay, well, let's reverse the flow of water again. So they said, okay, we'll figure out a way to flow it pumping the water south around 1981. Not surprising, then you start seeing the ecological changes in the Everglades and then the algal bloom, sea reptile, and Florida Bay. So I'll just show you data, this station halfway between, 
You see it in the 60s and 70s, very little water flowing south because of all the back country in the lake. Yeah, but you know, hurricanes every so often and so on, but mostly no. And then because of the policy changes in the 1980s, they start increasing the flow of water to the south. And of course, that meant increased water flowing into Florida back to you this slide before. And that's exactly when we start seeing the fishermen start seeing the algal blooms developing, and in 1987 the seagrasses died off. to that. Okay, just to illustrate this, this is during the 1989-90 drought, so there's very little fresh water going into the bay, so this blue indicates high salinity, and then the orange is low salinity here. You come out of the drought, okay, pump a lot of fresh water in the bay, that's what this orange here, this is all your fresh water coming in from the north, here. Down here, if during the drought, this is nitrogen on these two slides. So during the drought, when there's very little fresh water coming to the bay, very little nitrogen coming to the bay. Out of the drought, start dumping a lot of fresh water into the eastern side of the bay, you start dumping a lot of nitrogen in the eastern part of the bay. And of course, where this nitrogen now mixes with the phosphorus in the west, that's where you generate these large algal blooms right there in the bay. There's 15 years worth of data. We have a very distinct wet season, dry season cycle. So blue is water flow into the bay. You see this wet season and dry season cycle. And the green is the size of the algal blooms that you see that cycle. Here we just take monthly averages. Okay, here's going from January through December. So blue is water flow into the bay, green is the size of the algal blooms. So you see this is the dry season, the wet season. A little bit of a delay, it takes a while for the algae to grow, but you can see pretty good correlation there. Water flow, this low nutrient rich water, nitrogen rich water into the bay. Now, okay, that was just total algae. This is something that indicates that virtually that whole balloon is blue green algae. That'll become important a bit later on. Of course, on top of that, we also get longer term shifts in uh, the weather itself so because of El Nino, uh, oceanic oscillations, and so on, occasional shifts, and so on. So we look at, now we're looking at annual averages over many uh, years, decades here. So here's some uh, wet years, and here's some dry years. So this all correlates pretty well. Okay. Well, the sugarcane industry was not too happy with me showing a link between their operations and uh, the algorithm secrets off down in Florida Bay, and the politicians that pay off weren't too happy with this. Over years wasn't happy because everything shows an exact backwards of what the whole Everglades restoration South Florida Water Management District wasn't happy. A lot of people were not, not happy with my conclusions. So they paid off some people to, uh, to write the paper saying there's no correlation between runoff into the bay and the algorithms. What's interesting, they use the same data set that I did. Okay? I say there is a correlation. They said, no, there's no correlation whatsoever. No connection. Why is that? Well, it's because. Neither of us used the full data set. Okay. What I did is I took, I took the data at these four stations right here. They took the data at these stations here in blue. In other words, I took the data where the bloom occurs and found a very good correlation between runoff into the bay and the algal blooms. They carefully selected out just the stations over here where there is no algal bloom. There's no correlation. I'll let you decide which is a better way of treating the data. Unfortunately, there's a lot of that. I mean, they didn't technically, they didn't lie. But you look at the fine print for the methods, you'll see how they treated the data. Let's move up north now. Initially, there was no connection between the Kutsatchee River and Lake Okeechobee. That connection was made only so that you could drain the Everglades. Because if you don't, if you want to keep these areas down here dry, you got to put that water someplace. So they made the Connections here, so you can now back pump in the lake and then down in Blue Sand River. And there was no St. Lucie Canal, there was no connection at all between the lake and the uh, Indian River Lagoon over here. That canal is dug specifically to drain the Everglades and so on. Okay, so here's Lake Okeechobee here, here's the Blue Sand River, and these blue, I mean, these red dots indicate just high abundance of blue green algae. And here's uh, your Sandville Island. Four Myers and uh, Sam Bell Island here. Okay. Here's just a picture, there's blooms. This is one of the dams on the Coast Edge River. You see this 
big balloon the size of that, or blue green algae behind that dam. Okay, every time I take a cruise along the coastline here, here's Sandville Island, here's where the uh, Coast Edge River comes into the coastline, here's the Peace River, you can find mining area up here. I always see higher abundance of algae near the mouth of the Coast Edge River, suggesting that indeed the Coast Edge River is a major source of nutrients for the west coast. Here's a sterile bay, Coast Edge River estuary, Pine Island South here. So during the dry season when there's very little river flow, low abundance of algae, during the wet season when there's lots of flow down the Coast Edge River, High abundance of algae. Okay, here's just some data. We're looking at five years worth of data in Charlotte Harbor. Blue is river flow, green is the size of the algal blooms in Charlotte Harbor. So you can see again a good correlation. Pine Island Sound, Sterile Bay, same thing. Okay, in all these cases, I'm talking about just about algae in general. Just lumping all the different species together. Okay. This is the part that gets more complex now, and that is. You've got hundreds of species of algae all competing with each other for those nutrients. Okay. It's sort of like if you have bare plot soil, you throw fertilizer on it, and you water it, you can be sure you're just weeds growing up there, right? Can you predict which species of weed though? That's a tougher problem. Okay. So yeah, you throw a bunch of nutrients in the water, you're going to get an algae bloom from what species. Well, sometimes we're more interested in one particular species. In this case, what we're interested in now, is this here, this organism here, that's a dinoclavic called Trinity grubs. That's what produces the Florida red top. So certain years, this species wins out the competition for those nutrients, and then you get this massive red tide over on the west coast. And it's a concern because it produces this toxin here, a large complex molecule called brevitoxin. It's a neurotoxin. And you get massive fish kills. Uh, here's a boat harbor completely filled with uh, dead, rotting fish, uh, kills manatees, dolphins, sea turtles, and so on. And of course, it has an effect on people as well, which I'll come back to. Okay, I take 50 years worth of data, I just plot it, I just statistically average it. So this shows you the hot spot for a red tide. Basically, from about Tampa Bay down to Naples, and inshore along the coastline, that's the hot spot for a red tide. Heard about the news this past this past summer. Okay. It naturally lives in the Gulf Mexico, in the hot spot in the Gulf Mexico, is that area right there. However, every so often uh, you get unusual events in that slide, but basically you probably remember this past summer, you got a little bit of red tide over here. It's more up north, up around the uh, Santa Lucia area and so on, Stewart area. But what's happening there? Is it doesn't like living on this on the East Coast. What happens is, is we've got something called the loop current. We have uh, a control current coming through this straight to Yucatan, and this is an unstable current. So sometimes it makes a big loop up in the Gulf of Mexico and loops back down and then through the Straits of Florida as the Gulf Stream. Yeah. Other times it makes a shortcut here, like this, and it spins off a little eddy. And on the top scale, six months to 18 months, something like that, it's constantly meandering back and forth. Sometimes a shortcut, sometimes not. Okay. Well, every so often the conditions are right. If you've got a red tide offshore here and loop current sort of swings in short, it'll pick up some of that red tide and then carry it around into the Gulf Stream and it'll come in tour over here. That's what happened this past summer. Okay. So that happens maybe once every 10 years. So you don't need to worry about getting up. Massive red tide like you do on the west coast. Okay. But you might get a little bit every time. Usually, it mostly is very unusual actually, that happens down here in Miami. Usually, it's more up here in the central part of Florida where you tend to get uh, the, the water coming in shore than the red tide over there. Okay, so I go back to the west coast, the hot spot. If you just plot up, go to transect from the coastline going offshore, blue is salinity, so salinity goes down because you have fresh water coming off the land. Red is the average abundance of red tide, and it goes up. It sort of implies, suggests that maybe when it causes a nutrient, because of a runoff from land is rich in nutrients, that feeds the red tide with more red tide with more nutrients. Okay, same plot from the coastline going offshore. The difference is the blue is what it looked like on average 50 years ago. The red is what it looks like now. In other words, on average. 15 times more red tide 
today than you had two years ago. Uh, you get 15 times more red tide, you need 15 times more nutrients. I can't think of any natural sources of nutrients that have increased 15 fold over the last 50 years. What has increased dramatically over the last 50 years is South Florida. Basically, us, human activities, sewage, agriculture, etc. Okay, and you just look at how dense these red tides got. 50 years ago, the densest red tides got about 2.5 million cells per liter. Uh, and now it's more like 35 million cells per liter. It's kind of so we can add up to 100 million cells per liter. Okay. So again, a 15 fold increase. That needs to, that requires 15 times more nutrients. So once again, I was suggesting a, a linkage between uh, red tide, agriculture, and so on. And again, a lot of politicians and so on didn't like that. So once again, they hired some people to argue against this. And they said, nope, there's, no, there's not been an increase in red tide in Florida at all. Okay. And again, we're using the exact same data set. Okay. But again, you look at the fine print, you know, what you'll see. I took the raw data and did the statistical analysis. They manipulated the data first. And you'll notice, since the fine print, these categories were in consultation with the you know, state scientists. They took all the data, and if the abundance of red tide was less than 1,000 cells per liter, it was category <laughs> one, et cetera, et cetera. And so anything over 100,000 cells per liter was called category four. In other words, we went from category four to category four, no increase in red tide. It's the kind of games that people play to get to the fine print. There's all kinds of statistical games that people can play. Cushat River was not initially connected to Lake Okeechobee. By connecting it, though, see the blue is the initial watershed of the Cushat River. By connecting it to the lake, now you've included the sugarcane farms as part of the watershed, as well as the Kissimmee River basin. This was all wetlands. Wetlands are natural nutrient sink. By draining that land, now you release nutrients. Now it's a nutrient source rather than a nutrient sink. Same thing with the Kissimmee River Basin. This was largely wetlands, and the Army Corps of Nursing came in in the 60s and drained much of those wetlands, so it's now occupied by dairy farms, cattle ranches, citrus, etc. So once again, this area has gone from a nutrient sink to a nutrient source. So the Cushat River now has got a much larger, got a watershed four times larger than it did initially, and it's a lot of agriculture. So it's not surprising that the Kusat River has so much nutrients coming down. And you can see this uh, in the fossil record. A colleague of mine, Gene Turner, took some sediment cores from Charlotte Harbor. And you can date these with isotopes of looking at the history of nutrients in the century, go from the year 1800 to the year 2000. And you can see the latter part of the 20th century, you see these, all these nutrients shooting up. And the same thing with algal carbon in these, in these sediments. Shooting up in the latter part of the 20th century. Basically, corresponding, correlated with the increase in human population in the latter half of the 20th century. And here's just sort of seasonality. Blue is rainfall, January through December. So here's our dry season, here's our wet season. Orange is flow down the Cliffsedge River. And then red is the statistical average for red tide. Every year is going to look different, but you can see. Now, I've got lots of sequences. I'll just show you one sequence here. Okay. So here, we're looking in the year 2006. So here is flow down the Coos Hatch River. So it's low during the dry season, and then high in the wet season. Okay, so we started out in February in dry season. The uh, with the blue line here, it shows you how much water is coming down the Cusatch River and the Peace River here, and there's other rivers in Tampa Bay. Black dots mean the sample was taken and there's no red tide. The larger the red dot, the higher the abundance of red tide. So you're just going to go month by month through March, April, May, okay, pretty boring. Now June. You see a little bit of red tide developing near the mouth of the Cusatch River. And as we proceed now through the wet season, you see the red tide expanding, being carried by the coastal currents. And then eventually, 
Okay, the uh, health effects. This was initially known as neurotoxic shellfish poisoning uh, because shellfish are very good at concentrating the toxins in their tissues. It doesn't kill the clams or anything, it just accumulates the toxins. People come along and you know, they get extremely sick. That's very rare now because the state monitors for the red tide and they shut down any shellfish harvesting if there's a red tide out there. Okay. Uh, however, you still see, if you look at the hospital records during times of red tide, you'll see about a 40% increase in gastrointestinal. People go to the hospital for gastrointestinal disease. I'll come back to why I think that might be. The major effect on people today is this toxin gets up in the air as an aerosol. It acts like a, a tear gas. Okay? Irritates your eyes, nose, throat, lungs, and so on. Uh, if you look at the hospital records again, you'll see about a 50% increase of people going to the hospital for various types of respiratory distress during times of time. So people who uh, have uh, asthma, emphysema, like that, there's a good chance they'll Okay, uh, this is probably the most complex slide I have, but uh, this is concentration frequency spectrum. In other words, what we're looking at percentage of samples in which no red tide is found. Okay. Blue is what it was like 50 years ago, red is what it's like now. In other words, it used to be 70% of the time you find no red tide, now it's down to more like 40%. Same thing, up to 1,000 cells per that's considered natural background organism, and again, it's going down. But once you go to elevated concentrations, some elevated concentrations of the red tide, you see now it's changed. Now there's a much higher chance of getting red tide than what you found 50 years ago. Okay. Now what everyone focuses on is oh, when you get over 100,000 cells per liter. It's in this range right here, that they're concentrated enough, you can actually see the discoloration in the water. Okay, You start getting dead fish, Toxin now that kills the fish. Uh, and our satellites can also see it. So you're aware of the bullet. That's what you call it a natural red tide blue. I'm going to argue that these sublethal concentrations may be of concern as well. It's below 100,000 cells per liter. These concentrations have also increased over the last 50 years. But people don't notice it because you don't see the discoloration in the water. You don't see any dead fish. People don't. Obviously, getting sicker. But the toxin is still there. It's just not killing the fish. Well, a colleague of mine looked at a bunch of fish. There was no obvious red tide around. Hadn't been for a long time. Now, I know you can't see the numbers here. The point is, all these fish have brevitoxin in them. Okay. So I don't have to kill them, but they're getting it. Okay. It's sort of like methyl mercury. Okay. You, get, you eat a fair number of swordfish and large tuna stuff, you start getting those uh, methyl mercury. If you eat a lot of those fish, you're going to start getting mercury poisoning. Okay? Well, these fish here are getting sublethal concentrations of the brevitoxin. It's not enough to kill them. Okay? But what we're now seeing is dolphins out in the Gulf dying. There's no red tide around. But you do the autopsy, okay? they're packed full of brevitoxin, even though there's no red tide. I think what's happening is they're eating these fish. Okay? And over time, you're accumulating more and more brevitoxin until it finally becomes leakage. It's just like methyl mercury. If you start eating a lot of swordfish, you're going to eventually calm down with mercury poisoning. Okay. And that might get explained why we see people go to the hospital with gastrointestinal disorders. Because I think what happens during the red tide, you see a dead fish, you know not to eat it. But people catch a live fish, and they don't. The live must be okay. When you start eating those fish, you are getting small doses of brevitoxin. You start eating a lot of those fish. Okay, let's go back to blue-green algae now. Finish up here. Okay. That bloom in Florida Bay was uh, blue-green algae. Here's a satellite image of uh, Lake Okeechobee. Big bloom of uh, blue-green algae. It's, here's a surface view of it. Uh, there's Cusatch River. That's blue-green algae. This is a, called the Guacamole Bloom two and a half years ago in St. Lucie. Big bloom. Blue-green algae. Okay. Uh, we know blue-green algae can produce a number of different toxins. The one that's probably the most famous, that's known as microcystin. There's a the structure of the molecule here, and we know it's responsible for lots of animal deaths, human deaths, gastrointestinal disorders, and so on. Okay. 
This was actually discovered like 100 years ago uh, in Australia. A bunch of sheep died. Okay. Words, how do you discover a molecule like that? Okay. A bunch of sheep died. Well, they were all drinking from this pond over here. You go look at that pond, this big blue and blue green algae. So scientists go in and they start looking at what's in these blue green algae, and that's how that molecule was discovered. Okay. And that's how virtually all the algal toxins we know about have been discovered. A bunch of people get sick. Well, they all ate at a certain restaurant last night, and they all ate the clams. So you track back where were those clams harvested from. Well, they came from a certain estuary over here, and you see there's a bloom of some type of algae in that estuary, and you now discover the toxin. Versus all of the algal toxins we know about have been discovered that way. But what happened was, once biochemists had uh, discovered this molecule, then they started discovering, they started looking at exactly how it kills people. Sick or and once you do that, you discover it can also lead to long term liver damage. It's a tumor promoter. It can lead to things like liver cancer. Okay. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, what are tumor? What's a tumor? It, does it causes cancer. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, now think for a second. Suppose this molecule caused liver cancer. It did not have any short-term effects at all. Okay, notice now those sheep sort of die in different locations, different times, 10 or 20 years later. Would you have ever been able to track that liver cancer back to that pond? Okay. Or all the other toxins. That if you only have a long-term effect, and you only uh, make organisms sick or, or kill them, 10 or 20 years later, you're never going to be able to figure out cause of that because people are dying at different locations, different times. It's almost impossible to track that back. However, we think we have recently discovered a toxin that does have that kind of effect. Well, what about being back on this? So anyway, just think of a potentially toxic compound or nasty compound produced by algae. Okay? Some of them just smell bad. Okay? I was talking to people up in Stewart, Fort Myers, and they'll tell you how awful the smell was. Make the water taste bad. People use lakes for their water supply. Uh, we can call it. Skin irritation. Some of these lakes here in Florida, you go swimming in it, all of a sudden you're, it's like your skin is on fire. This is what we call a dermatoxin. So it causes gastrointestinal dis dis intestinal disorders, neurological disorders, and, all. and then the more long term effects potentially are things like liver damage, neurodegenerative diseases, and cancer. And I call it. An, might sound odd, but I sort of call these the good toxins, because you know right away if you're being exposed to it, you can do something about it. A good example, this is red tides. You walk along the beach on the west coast, you get that toxin, your eyes and nose are irritated. You know right away if you're being exposed to that toxin, just get off the beach. <coughs> on the other hand, that toxin causes cancer, well, that's going to be 10 or 20 years from now. You have no idea that you're being exposed to a toxin. It only has long term effects now. So well, fairly recently, we discovered a molecule that we think only has these long-term effects, it's called BMA. And there's increasing evidence that can lead to neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. And this is produced by virtually all blue green algae. Okay, and these are called the tangled diseases because the characteristic of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, and Parkinson's disease is you accumulate these protein tangles in your Accumulate more and more of these tangles that eventually kill your brain cells. Okay. And they are primarily environmental in Earth. They're only like 1 to 5% genetic. Uh, so it's got to be some type of environmental cause or trigger. And after many decades of research, we still do not have a good understanding of what kind of factors, environmental factors, can lead to these neurodegenerative diseases. The exception to this is Huntington's disease. That is 100% genetic. We know that it's involved in that. Okay. Anyway, they're tangled diseases because of characteristic. Is all these different types of protein tangles accumulating in the brain cells. Okay, how this got discovered is because of an unfortunate event that happened uh, on the island of Guam during the after World War II. Uh, the Americans and Japanese are fighting over the uh, islands in the Western Pacific. The native Chamorro people on Guam, as a result of the war, uh, had relatively uh, low food supply, they were in bad shape. 
but they had guns available to them for the first time. And so they started eating a lot of fruit bats. They had two species of fruit bats living on the island. And so they started shooting all the fruit bats and eating them. And so what you see here, this is a population of fruit bats on the island of Guam, and basically they drive those species to extinction. Then, about 20 years after they eat up all the fruit bats, you see a hundredfold increase in the incidence of neurodegenerative diseases among the native people. Of Some villages, like 20% of the people die from these neurodegenerative diseases. And then 20 years after the bats go extinct and you're no longer eating them, you see a huge decline in these neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, medical community looked into this and they spent decades trying to figure out what caused all this, never figured out. And then a guy by the name of Paul Cox took a totally different approach. He's an ethnobotanist, not a traditional medical researcher. And he came up with this following hypothesis. It's kind of a crazy one initially. And what he found there was an unusual food chain there. Okay. Uh, well, bottom line, he calls them flying foxes. Oops. He calls them flying foxes, but they're really fruit bats. Okay. And what he found was really high concentrations of VMAA Remember that number, around 3,500. And what happens was, we discovered was, there were cyanobacteria living symbiotically on the superficial roots of these cycad trees, okay? And the BMA biomagnified from the cyanob from the blue-green algae into the cycads, into their seeds, and the fruit bats eat the seeds. So you get this unusual food chain here, and you get this huge biomagnification of BMA into these fruit bats. Okay, and if you now look at the brains of the Chamorro people who died of these neurodegenerative diseases, you see high concentrations of this BMA in their brains. Okay. The controls were Canadians who died of something else, and you don't see BMA in the brain. But here's two Canadians who died of Alzheimer's. Presumably these Canadians were not eating fruit bats from Guam. So it suggests it's not just there's a really strange food chain in Guam, there's other pathways. So my colleague at the University of Miami Medical School, Deborah Mash, look, she runs the brain bank over at their medical school. So she looked at a bunch of Americans who died of ALS or Alzheimer's. And sure enough, you see high levels of BMA in their brains. Controls down here, no BMA. Now you could argue what's the cause and effect here. I mean, you could argue that maybe having a neurodegenerative disease would lead to your brain accumulating BMA rather than but that's where Huntington's disease comes in because it's 100% genetic. And indeed, you look at these folks, no BMA in their brain. Suggest, indicates that yes, it's BMA leading to these neurodegenerative diseases rather than the reverse. So once I saw those data, I got with her and said, you know, you know I'm studying blue, so blue green algae right here in Florida. Could you be getting biomagnification of BMA in our food chains here in Florida from uh, blue green algae blooms up through the seafood? So we go back to Florida Bay, one of those blue green algae. Oops. Here's two pink shrimp from that area. Here's a pink shrimp, 3,000, almost the same concentration as those fruit bats from Guam. Another one, 1,500, half that. Uh, I didn't talk about this bloom here, it takes a little more time, but basically, summer 2005, Florida Department of Transportation uh, bulldozed a lot of the mangroves along the 18 mile stretch going from the mainland down to Key Largo. As a result of that, they released huge amounts of phosphorus and generated a huge bloom of blue green algae. It lasted from about 2005 to 2008. Uh, I was not working on BMA at the time, so I was kind of oblivious to this. But then when I got involved, uh, I wanted, wanted to get a hold of some animals that had been in this bloom. Uh, couldn't really find anything, but I did have a colleague of mine who had done a, a study up in this area, right at the edge of the bloom, but at the end of the bloom, 2008. So it wasn't ideal, but I said, well, let's just see what we can find. Okay. This is what it looked like, low, low abundance of algae before the bulldozers and mangoes, and this is what it looked like after the huge bloom. So we got a lot of variability in the data because it wasn't an ideal sample. But nevertheless, what you could find, here's a blue crab, 7,000, twice as high. Another one, 5,000. There's a pufferfish, 7,000. So you're, you're getting high levels of BMA in the food chains here in the South Florida Bay Seafood. Cushatchee River, those, oops, 
You have those blooms, those are the Clusiatria or blue green algae. And those are these fish, typically ranging around 500 to 2,500, something like that. Pretty high levels. Okay, uh, I didn't show you any data, but basically you have blooms of these blue green algae on the lake. Okay, and they get carried down the St. Lucie Canal into the uh, estuary and into the southern part of the Indian River. Okay. So I was able to get a permit to get brain tissue from the dolphins that live in the Indian River Lagoon. It's an endangered species, so whenever you just they find a dead dolphin, they do a full autopsy. But this just shows over the St. Lucie area there, downstream of the Okeechobee, the blood of the green algae. So here's six dolphins. Okay, five of them may have high concentrations of the BMA in the brain. This dolphin did not. The autopsy showed this dolphin had been hit by a boat. Okay. In case of the others, they could, the autopsy could not find any obvious cause of death. So it's a little suggestive that maybe they died from the BMA. And I've talked to two people who studied the behavior of dolphins in the, in the Indian River Lagoon. They told me they've sometimes seen dolphins that seem confused, seem lost. So it sounds just like an autonomy case. We don't know why, we don't know how, so Okay, very, very quickly, the mechanism. BMA is an unusual amino acid. Right? We all need 20 different amino acids to build up all our proteins and so on. But what it turns out is BMAA looks very similar to serine. Serine we need in our body. BMA we don't want to have, okay? Well, because BMA looks similar to serine, the transfer RNA or uh, serine will accidentally sometimes pick up BMA if you have a lot of BMA in your diet. Okay? So what you end up doing is putting the wrong amino acid into your protein. So you depend upon the proper sequence of amino acids in your protein for them to function properly, fold up properly. So here's a slinky that's folded up properly. Proteins. Okay? But if you accidentally start putting serine, I'm going to put BMA in the place of serine, now the, that protein is not going to fold up properly. That's the kind of stuff you get. Okay. That's what you're getting from your brain, those, remember those tangles accumulating in your brain cells as you develop Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or ALS. Okay. So if you have a diet high in BMA, you're getting more and more of this BMA getting incorporated in a place of serine, and you slowly accumulate more and more of these protein tangles. That's why these neurodegenerative diseases take maybe 10 or 20 years to develop. You're slowly accumulating more and more of these protein tangles until eventually kills you. The pharmaceutical industry is always looking for new antibiotics, uh, antiviral compounds, anti-cancer compounds. Okay? Think about it, most of our pharmaceuticals, uh, pharmaceuticals, drugs and what have come from natural products. That's why they run around the rainforest, the coral reefs, they go all over the world looking for new chemicals that might be useful medically. Okay? And they've looked at blue green algae, very few compounds. And they found over a thousand unusual chemicals produced by blue green algae. This is not natural metabolic products. They clearly are synthesized by blue green algae for some function. They've got to be bioactive. You said the vast majority of kids, we have no idea what they may do to our health. But if you're exposed to these blue green algae blooms, you're getting exposed to these chemicals. You simply don't know what they might do to us. All kinds of strange. Uh, well, we know eating them will be a problem, and that's what we're working on right now. Can you breathe it in? Right. Is that another uh, possibility? Well, I was thinking skin contact. Yeah, yeah. We don't know yet. Okay. It's certainly not a good idea to go swimming in these blooms. Right. Uh, so, yeah. so again, going back to this idea here, here then, uh, again, I call these the good toxins because you know right away. These are the toxins we've discovered, because you know, if you have an immediate effect, then you can sort of track it back to the source. Okay. Much more insidious are the ones down here. If you have a compound like BMA that has no short-term effects, you can't taste it, smell it, anything. You have no idea you are exposed to it. But only you come down with cancer or neurodegenerative disease or, or liver damage 10 or 20 years later. That's much more insidious. My concern here is we discovered BMA by accident, because it's unusual. 
those thousands of compounds produced by blue green algae, how many more of those compounds may cause long term health effects like death? In this cheapest scan, you've got some of the most pristine waters, actually. You've got big problems over the west coast of the red tide. You've got blue green algae in Lake Okeechobee, um, the Stewart area, Fort Myers area, and so on. Okay. Uh, and you've got two and a half million people here on the western side of this game. Why is it low abundance of algae? Those love so, uh, septic tanks, lawn fertilizer, and so on. It's because this cane bay is phosphorus limited. You've got essentially a wall of limestone filtering at that phosphorus before it gets into this cane bay. Now, eventually, you will saturate that limestone. There's some concern that it might get worse. We're starting to see more and more seagrass die offs and so on in this cane bay. That is basically why you actually have some of the cleanest water uh, around in South Florida. Everywhere else is much more. Stop there. I'll take questions. Last summer, it seemed like we had the perfect storm, even in our pristine, wonderful water here. It was unswimmable from May to October. It right out here. And we had the sargassa weed. We had the blue, a little bit of blue green algae. At one point, we had a little tundra at a red tide that right. came down. And on top of that, extreme heat. Florida is a tourist-based economy and fishing and agriculture. Something has to, I mean, if it's political and if it's, it's semi-political, semi -political, okay, then that has to be addressed. If it's a natural thing that happens because of climate or whatever, that's a little more difficult. Do you think this is going to be repeated again this summer? Uh, it's hard to say because it depends upon the weather. I mean, it's, we're generating a lot of nutrients on the land. And what happens this past two years, essentially, or a year, year, year and a half, year and a half, I should say, remember 2007, we had Hurricane Irma go pretty much in, up the entire length of Florida. So you already saturated the whole watershed with a lot of water. And then this past May, we got unusual amounts, record amounts of rain. Okay, so all your nutrients are running down into your waterways. You've built up huge amounts of this nutrient water in Lake Okeechobee. Okay. And that lake is surrounded by this 30 foot earthen dike. If that water gets too high, that earthen dike will burst, drowning thousands and tens of thousands of people. So the Army Corps of Engineers, when that lake gets too high, they have no choice but to open up the dams, huge amounts of water down into the Sash River and the San Luis. Okay. And so, and when that happens, you have these huge blooms of blue-green algae in Lake Okeechobee going down the Kutsatch River. And when that nutrient-rich water in May hit the coastline, you already had a little bit of red tide, it was called the Bronx previously. When it hit the coastline this past May and June, that's exactly when the red tide got really large. And that's when you start seeing all the fish kills, and manatees, and dolphins dying, and everything. And that's when it hit, hit the news. Okay. Depends on what the weather. If this year we have a dry summer, then you won't see much of it. How it is predicting the weather. Well, that's the same thing with predicting the red tide and so on. You can't predict very well. But certainly, I mean, the nutrients are there. You start dumping all these nutrients into your local waters, you know, you're going to get more out of it. Yes? Yeah, you really had two different talks here, and both of them are fascinating. You have an incredible data set. Uh, we had so many questions come up in my mind, but one of them is uh, we always. Sugarcane has always been painted as a big deal, but it seems from what you said, really, it's the exposure of heat that causes the, the nutrient, the uh, nitrogen increase. Right. So, what what's the solution there? I mean, should we? Well, the scientific point is a very simple flood flood the area. Or yeah, I mean, there's a very simple solution, from my perspective, as scientists, okay, ignore the whole politics and everything. First of all, you stop the sugar subsidy. That that saves Americans two to five billion dollars. You're there. Turn off the pumps, it will naturally flood. As soon as you flood that organic feed, you stop the nutrient source, you stop the nitrogen source. And it becomes nitrogen, well, become a nutrient sink again. Okay? So that's a simple solution, except the sugar cane farmers don't like that, and they have a lot of political stuff. They give lots of money to what the Democrats and Republicans, and they have options always open to contagious and subsidies, even though they don't cancel the long run. Is anybody listening to you? 
that would do their best to get court. I mean, when the when the Everglades Comprehensive the Everglades Restoration Plan came up for public comment in 1999, before it was passed by the U.S. Congress, I testified before the head of the Army Corps of Engineers and the head of the South Florida Water Management Division about the fundamental flaws and their overall plan. It was totally ignored because the politics had already been sorted out. They knew what they were going to do. They didn't care about the people. I can tell you lots of stories. I mean, I know lots of people on the inside, on the lower levels within the Army Corps of Engineers and South Florida Water Management Division. They will privately agree. They say what I'm saying is correct. They publicly say these things, they lose their jobs. It just seems like there's really no top down structure. There's no solution uh, that's viable, viable solution. Well, there is a viable solution, but from a scientific point of view, it's just when you get the politics involved, you know, it's very difficult. I should also point out, you know, in the, yeah, it's not fertilizer from the sugar cane environment. Well, it is phosphorus fertilizer that's polluted in the Everglades, but it's the nitrogen from the nitrogen peak deposits that's causing the problem in Florida Bay. So, but again, you know, the issue, the issue there is draining the land. It makes no difference if it's sugarcane, tomatoes, housing subdivisions, it makes no difference. Whatever you do, if you drain the land, you're going to be releasing that land. Now, in the case of the red tide on the West Coast, it's a little bit more complex. They got blamed, the sugarcane farmers got blamed for the red tide, and it's not that simple because remember, you have that huge agricultural area to the north of Lake Okeechobee. That's actually the major source now, and they don't back pump anymore because of the lawsuits in the 70s. Now, they still, because of the back pumping, there's huge layers of nutrient-rich mud on the bottom of the lake, and that it's a shallow lake and it gets resuspended. So they're what we call their legacy nutrients from what they dumped in the lake in the 60s and 70s. That's still then going down the Pacific River and feeding red tide and so on. But they always like to say, well, we're pumping only a small amount of water to the lake anymore. We do very little back pump anymore, so it can't be our nutrients. That's not quite true. Yes? Uh, do you know if there's any reason why the so specific salinity level that the dinoflagellates that make up red tide prefer? Um, and Well, they like full strength seawater. They can survive down about half strength seawater. Okay, but they generally tend to prefer yeah, more. Yeah, so they're in your coastal waters and to some extent your estuaries. But if you have too much fresh, because they like the nutrients in the fresh water flow. Yeah, that was my question. Because you had that graph that showed fresh water coming I mean, yeah, in, then you know, that kills them. You know, there's a good example in 2004 when we had four hurricanes in Florida. Three went, uh, three of those hurricanes went right over the watershed of the Peace and Cusatchee Rivers. So you have massive amounts of water coming down the Cusatchee River. Massive amount of nutrients, okay? And what happened was, initially, there wasn't much red tide near the mouth because it was essentially fresh water. Huge fresh water plume coming out there, and the red tide couldn't take it, okay? However, once it got diluted with salt water and the salinity went up, you went up generated a huge red tide that lasted for like, a, what was that, 19 months, 17 months, I guess, from late 2004 to early 2006. And that red tide was probably even worse than the one we had this past summer. So then that sort of strengthens the argument where you were showing that graph that showed that the red tide increased as salinity decreased. Because um, since they don't actually prefer less saline water, then it's more likely that they're increasing because of nutrient. Right. Right. Yes. May be a little off the topic, but I swim at the lighthouse most of the day. And I live near Camden Park. So I had to find the water there. I know the park people, it tests always good at Cape Florida. And is it something to do with the flow of the water? Or well, yeah, the Gulf Stream, I mean, the Gulf Stream is only a few miles away, so yes. you tend to have a lot more flushing, and so that right. also helps here at Biscuit. Even though it goes, the tide goes in both directions, right. still basically it's flush a lot more. Yeah, yeah, but that's, a, that's actually, the, I, that's, I didn't go into it here, I don't want the time, but. That's why I can, I can explain that hot spot over there on the west coast because it's much more sluggish water because of the oceanography over there. Okay. That's why you're actually one of the best places here in South Florida. That's you right. can clean water. It might not be perfectly clean, but it's much cleaner than any place else around here in South Florida. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good, really. Now, you are getting some sargassum, and that's a big problem. It's an increasing problem in the last decade. Yeah. But that's not a, for much, and that's not a local issue. That's coming from 
down the Caribbean, back in the Trail region. I only got you know, no one really knows, but my gut feeling, because of the deforestation of the Amazon and the Congo basin, you're getting more nutrients going to the Equatorial area. We're getting more sorry acid in the Equatorial region, and that's getting carried by the current. So, is that is that bad for you, the sorry acid? Is that not that we know of? No. Small amounts are actually good for the ecosystem, but the mass amounts now in some places, the Caribbean, they, it's not packed ten feet tall on beaches and stuff. They completely clogged some of the harbors. Well, a good example is in the early parts of the Everglades restoration, 2001, I think it was. They started digging up some of the organic peat as part of the whole restoration project. And I can just see it going down Shark River and downstream ahead of what we ended up calling the black water. You can actually see it with satellite imagery. It was dark black water. When that water hit the uh, uh, lower uh, Florida Keys, it killed off all the forest. Now, now the, where the controversial is, during the same time, I've had to switch my thought here, but you can show a very good correlation between the flow of water coming, the increase in water, water coming down into Florida Bay. You can document by satellite imagery that stuff makes it out to the Florida Keys and the reefs. Okay? And so during that same time, you see. It's a decline of the coral reefs back in the Florida Keys. It's amazing. We've lost 90% of our coral reefs. It was happening during the same time with all this increased nutrients going down from Florida Bay. But it's hard to say because, uh, you know, the coral reefs are college. I'm not a coral reef ecologist, but my colleagues in the past have said something. But you also have the global warming issue. There's a bunch of other things, the diseases and so on. So there's a lot of argument back and forth. My view is. All the sturdy water is weakening the immune response to those corals, and so they're more susceptible to all these strains and diseases that they're getting. But it's not really the problem. Yes? Are you bleeding shrimp out of Florida Bay? No. Okay. Well, that's a good Is there anything else you're not eating from local waters? I, personal, personal, I would not eat anything. Eat anything. Well, I mean, I'll eat, I'll eat like, um, uh, you know, some of the offshore tunas. And Salmon, cold waters, things like that. But uh, down here, I'll be, remember, it's not, I'm just talking about algal toxins, right? There's also a big methyl mercury problem. There's a lot of methyl mercury coming down the Everglades as well. So, so. And, and uh, insecticides and so on. There's a lot of other stuff. You mentioned earlier something about bottom feeders. You mentioned crab and shrimp. Oh, yeah. You consider them bottom feeders too? Yeah, and we weren't looking for it, but once we took all of our data and just started looking at it, what we discovered, and the Swedes have found the same thing over the Baltic. Okay, it turns out it's mostly the organisms in the feed on the bottom that tend to have a higher DMA than the ones that live up in the water column, and that makes sense because in the shallow place like Florida Bay, what I showed a long time ago. If you look at the total abundance of algae in that water column, there's 20 times more sitting on the bottom than in the water column above. So what you'll end up with this, is this blue bean algal scum sitting on the bottom. And so it's the animals feeding on that <coughs> algae that the biggest dose of the DNA. So is this like shelf crabs? Well, we only, tested blue, <laughs> we only tested blue crabs. I would guess shelf crabs are the same. They won't allow you to test them. I would guess it'd be the same thing. The problem is BMA analysis is like very difficult and, and expensive. So we ran out of money. There's lots of things I'd like to test. Me. Yeah. I went to a lecture at Rosenstiel a few years ago. I mean, had been following the dolphin in Sarasota Bay for years. And they found that in the recent times, because their fish that they normally fed were gone, they were feeding on the bottom. And their firstborn of a dolphin died because of the, of the pollution from the bottom in the mother's milk. Yeah. And, that's, the, and the second ones died, 60% of the second ones died. Yeah, that's, that's common phenomenon of uh, in marine mammals in general because a lot of these toxins accumulate in the fatty tissues. And so what you'll find is if you look at the males of marine mammals, 
over time, they build up higher and higher concentrations of these toxins. Notice that females, they do not. The reason is because when they have babies, they're basically transferring a lot of those lipids as energy to their embryos and to the babies. Right. And so then the, 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 the babies die because they're no chance. basically the mother is returning transfer most of those toxins to the babies. So they keep some others and keep really low level of toxins in their blood and basically sacrificing their babies. So I don't eat a lot of fish. So it's not just dolphins, I mean you see the same phenomenon in seals and other mammals as well. Yes. I hear that a lot, but not really. I mean, to generate more algae, you need more nutrients. Now, at a higher temperature, the algae may grow a little faster. But again, in terms of global warming, we're talking about like one degree past a century or something. So that's a really subtle increase. Uh, so, I mean, you, you have to see a correlation. Again, you get our blooms during the summer and fall months when the warm water's the warmest. That's also when you have the wet season, and that's your land run up of the nutrients. So it's really the nutrients. More nutrients will get more algae, higher temperature will not.